Welcome to our first ever online panel discussion. Thank you all for being here with us. We have a great lineup of speakers uh, before you today. This session is brought by AWIB, Association of Women in Boldness. I am uh, your host for this afternoon. My name is Falak Ajzode, uh, current AWIB president and co-founder of Yeni. AWIB is a membership-based association that fosters that fosters self and professional development for women in Ethiopia to unleash their leadership potential. We do this through our monthly programs, weekend trainings, uh, workshops, and seminars. We have two flagship events, uh, May, May Forum and Women of Excellence. May Forum is a, monthly, is a whole day event uh, that fosters the culture of dialogue and professional development. We also do skill building workshops while Women of Excellence is a one-of-a-kind celebratory event that we host in October to identify and celebrate the phenomenal women in our community that support their community through various causes. Uh, if you want to know more about these uh, events, visit our website at awob.org.et. Uh, Women of Excellence is a, is a platform for us to create our own role models for our children and our future generations. Now, I know uh, 2020 has been a challenging time for all of us, but there are still celebratory moments to be acknowledged. For instance, AWIB turning 10 years old this year. So AWIB, congratulations for turning 10. Um, now, once again, I would like to welcome all of you to this um, important discussion and a timely, timely uh, topic that addresses the impact of women leadership in Ethiopia's healthcare institutions. Uh, to help us uh, discuss this important topic, we have three amazing panel speakers. But before I introduce them to you, I would like to do a little bit of a housekeeping item. Uh, for any questions and comments you have, please make sure to use the chat box available. But particularly the questions that you have to, uh, towards our panelists, make sure to put that in the QA uh, chat box and any comments you have in the chat box comment section, and we'll be able to address those uh, accordingly. Now, uh, coming to our panelists, we have Dr. Sanait Bayena, a senior advisor to the minister, uh, Her Excellency Dr. Lia Tadessa at the Ministry of Health. She's also one of the co-founding co members of, and current president of Ethiopian Medical Women Association. We have Dr. Azeb Asamino, a psychiatrist at La Beza Psychiatry Center. She also leads the mental health and psychosocial support team for Ministry of Health's Advisory Council on COVID-19. Welcome, Azib. Uh, Dr. Aser Agay, an Associate Professor of Medical Laboratory Sciences at the College of Health Sciences at the University um, of Addis Ababa. Uh, she's also the former CEO of the Ur Ambassa, the largest hospital in the country. Thank you all for being here with us. Now, um, I would thank you. All right, so I would like to start off the discussion by giving you five minutes to briefly uh, introduce yourselves, tell us how you got to where you are in your current profession uh, at a leadership position. Um, I will start off with uh, Dr. Sanait. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. Thank you, Ewi, for giving us this platform. Um, as Faye has said, uh, I am Sanait. I am currently working as a senior advisor for the health minister, Dr. Lia. And I am also the current uh, president mm -hmm. for Ethiopian Medical Women Association. Uh, mm -hmm. So I basically grew up in the Northern Addis, Shromeda, and uh, I grew up in a family where uh, I was, uh, you know, praised for what I do. I was acknowledged for whatever I accomplished. And I was being given a responsibility from early age and that has actually given me the experience and the courage to be who I am today and um, also gave me the platform to develop my confidence to be where I am today. Thank you, Faye. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Aser? Okay, thank you. I would like to thank Ewu for giving us this opportunity. My name is Aster, uh, an associate professor at the Department of Medical Laboratory Science of Addis Ababa University. I'm also a fellow and uh, current executive board member of the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences. 
co-founder of an association known as the Society of Ethiopia Women in Science and Technology and current president. Uh, I was born in Nazareth Adama and uh, grew up in Harar. That's where my current, I'm um, formatted, I would say, in Harar, especially during my primary education. And then after finishing my high school, I went to Addis Ababa University. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Aziz? Uh, thank you, Ewu, for the platform. Uh, I am Aziz, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a young psychiatrist. Uh, I, um, I was born in Addis and uh, I grew up in Addis and most of my work has been in Addis and uh, I attended my undergraduate education and postgraduate education at Addis Ababa University um, and um, uh, for three years I've been working at Deborah Marcos University as a, a psychiatrist and as well as, as an assistant professor. Uh, I've been teaching medical students and recently I moved back to Addis um, and um, as you said, I work in uh, Laviza Psychiatry Center and I'm also joining Addis Ababa University uh, soon. And I um, currently I'm uh, at uh, the Ethiopian Medical Women Association. I work in the executive committee as the public relation and members engagement director. And also in the Ethiopian Psychiatric Association, I also work in the public relation. Uh, and the, uh, I'm also the founder of the uh, Monday Life Again Book Fest, which is formed by the uh, Monday La Washington uh, Fellows of the year 2018 of uh, the physicians, it's a physicians group. And I work as a main health consultant in the in Book Fest in Action, which works in uh, health promotion. And currently, I work in the uh, uh, advisory council for the Federal Ministry of Health, and I lead the main health and psychosocial support team. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so, um, you know, our current discussion is going to be what's the impact of women leaders. So we're going to go straight into um, some of the questions. When you talk about leadership, uh, you know, it's always equivalent to what are the challenges you face. So um, let's try to be as candid as possible when we respond to, our que to the questions that are coming. So uh, Dr. Aster, I would like to start with you. Uh, I know you've had um, uh, held various uh, leadership positions throughout your career, one of them being uh, the CEO of the Urambasa, which is the largest country, uh, the largest hospital in the country, like I stated before. Can you tell us what were the challenges you faced um, uh, being in that role? And also the various roles that you've taken on as a leader. Uh, what were the main prominent challenges you, you would say that um, you faced and were able to overcome and how you were able to overcome them? Uh, thank you. Uh, as you rightly said, I was a CEO. You know, mostly what, what I remember as a CEO of the Black Line Hospital is the good days that I have in that hospital. The main challenge during my time was related to finance. The Grambasa Specialized Hospital being the largest referral hospital in this country, it was getting a budget even much smaller than St. Paul Hospital. Uh, just as an example. So the major challenge during those days was related to, as I said, uh, budget. But even then, I would say I was lucky, despite, uh, you know what, many people do not understand. When I was a CEO of the Black Line Hospital, all the medical doctors, except very few, who have been in, uh, I mean, recruited through the hospital, almost all of them were under the School of Medicine and they are accountable to the Dean of the School of Medicine. Luckily, the Dean at that time was a very good person, Dr. Dereza, we were, you know, reading each other, you know, we are harmonizing our work. And thank you for all the medical doctors of the Krambasa Special Aid Hospital. They have never said it's none of your business. They could have said that because administratively, there was nothing that makes them accountable to the CEO. They were under the deal. So uh, I would say, other than the budget, uh, being a woman, I don't think I have a problem. But with the uh, Black Lion Hospital, one, uh, the major uh, problem, as I mentioned, is a budget one. But there are also both internal, external interest in the hospital. And as you also know, it's the last labor referral hospital during those days. There was no cancer 
preference center in this country. It was the only hospital. Everybody was referred to Black Lion. At the same time, there was no single penny budget for cancer. So basically, we were, you know, having drugs, uh, diagnostics, everything through donations, through the physicians, through networks. Otherwise, there was no single budget for cancer patients while the hospital was, you know, harboring all the huge burden of this country. So for me, I would say these were the major challenges. Uh, otherwise, uh, being a woman, I, I don't remember. Even if there are people who may think so, but I've never thought of myself being a woman and having been challenged as a woman and a leader of that hospital. So I would say I was lucky because as I said, since I, under, I understand when I was assigned as a CEO of that hospital with all the challenge, luckily, I think that was also my, I mean, my quality, I would say, I was trying to liberate from, you know, uh, I mean, uh, volunteerism was not uh, as common at these days, but I was so lucky to get volunteers to help me in the OR, for example, there was the Seattle Anesthesia Outreach helping us in the OR, John Hopkins University in emergency medicine, I mean, especially with the pediatric emergency renovation, even there were uh, individuals like the Mamukacha family whom I met through one of the physicians who were helping us. In fact, the current, the current ICU in the before ward was initially renovated by the Mamukacha family. So you know what? So I was trying to engage anyone from any direction whom I think could help me in the success of, I mean, making the Black Line host that successful. So those, there are these challenges as much as possible. I was trying to engage and bring anyone whom I think will help me uh, in uh, making that hospital successful. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. Uh, I don't know whether you can hear me. This is Meryl. Can you hear me? I, 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 yes, yes, Faye. I'm I'm Faye yeah, Faye is having difficulties in uh, connecting, so I'm just going to, until she comes back, because she is having difficulties in her internet, so until she comes back, I'll be stepping in on behalf of her. This is Meron from Impala Communication. Uh, so the next question would be uh, the same similar question, but addressing to uh, Dr. Sanai. Thank you, Meron, for stepping in for Faye. And thank you for the question also. Thank you, Dr. Asir, for explaining what has been your journey look like while you were working as a CEO for Black Line Hospital. So um, uh, I want to start with medical school. So I was basically gently pushed to join medicine uh, as I actually went to Gondor University for my undergrad. And um, uh, while there, you know, it, um, but once you joined, it is the best thing you can be. And you should be able to be the best thing you could be wherever you are. So with that belief, for me, the biggest challenge was actually to balance the greatest expectations and, um, uh, and the overwhelming support that I received from my family and my friends when I joined medicine and balancing that with a very stressful learning teaching process and um, the daily hurdles that I have to put up to deliver on, on all those expectations. Uh, but while navigating through, um, uh, while after I graduated, uh, the biggest challenge for me was um, to actually bring people believe in what I believe in. And um, however, I, I used to navigate because I demand usually support from my surrounding. And um, whenever I need support, I'm, I'm not never afraid to ask for support. So that's how I navigated. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. So it, the same questions, some, same challenge, same difficulties throughout your journey. Oh, so I don't know whether you can hear me. I'm sorry. But if, throughout your journey, if you, if I also, uh, Dr. Azif can continue with that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mira. Um, I think 
for me, um, when I was a child, my parents were a big influence on me. Um, my mother was uh, what held the leadership position and uh, on this uh, uh, bus company. So she was she was one of the few women who uh, took on leadership position. And so I, I grew up looking at that and I grew up uh, uh, seeing how she held up herself um, uh, in meetings and things like that. Whenever I went to uh, her office, everyone would say, okay, you've got a great mother, you're lucky. So I felt like I, would, I could do anything. Uh, and I, I didn't think uh, being a woman was a factor. And I grew up at a time where there was a lot of movement uh, to support women's rights. Uh, I heard on the radio, on TV, uh, the, the fight of the Ethiopian Women Lawyers Association against child marriages and things like that. So uh, I didn't think, I didn't have any um, um, doubts that I could do anything that I wanted. Um, and uh, when I became interested in uh, studying people's behavior and helping people, my parents helped me, my, my community helped me achieve that. And um, when I decided to become a psychiatrist, I decided very early on in ninth grade. And uh, I, found, I, I knew that I had to go through medical school to go to psychiatry. Uh, but when I joined medical school, I didn't find it as exciting that I, as I would have hoped. Um, I felt like it was too limited in its view. Uh, it didn't allow for creativity. It didn't allow for, um, you know, seeing things in different perspectives. Uh, everyone was just focused on studying and studying all the time. And I tried to find my own way through it uh, because I, 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 I couldn't uh, limit myself to uh, just one thing. So I decided to join the Ethiopian Medical Students Association. That's actually where I met Dr. Afe for the first time as the CEO of that hospital. And seeing her lead uh, that, uh, that hospital with such grace and uh, she supported young people and things like that, it gave me such a boost in my confidence that also in medical, uh, in the medical world, there's a place for uh, women also and people like me, you know, and it's good to see her. And also there was also other people along the way uh, in the, who held positions in departments uh, and in leading the school and the college. And that gave me a, a little bit of boost and also the support I got as part of that association in widening my um, perspectives was very helpful. Uh, I think the biggest challenge I faced after that was actually at work. Uh, after I went to, uh, especially after I went to Dabra Marcos uh, in the university, I was the, the only woman in the room, the only uh, uh, specialist uh, that was available in that university. And I often found myself to be the only woman in many meetings, in many conversations, and there was no one uh, who I could look up to. And prior to that, I always had someone that I could look up to. But at that point, I felt very lonely. It was a, a lonely experience. And I always found myself to have to um, be the one to advocate for other women or advocate for the rights of women in general. And, uh, and that experience was not easy because sometimes I was seen as the, the, the loudest person in the room or the... Uh, the one who challenged people too much uh, and uh, and I realized that the culture is also different and the expectation is very high uh, and also in practicing psychiatry I also found that uh, there was um, uh, high mental health challenges in women especially from rural areas and I found that there that, that there was a pattern uh, where the the precipitants of their illness were associated with either early marriages or um, having children very early in their life and having uh, to have uh, an increased um, responsibilities uh, at home. So those factors were uh, really concerning for me and uh, I think it made me even bolder as time goes by. Thank you. I think it's wonderful because I think one thing that uh, highlighted in this is always how you know when as we grow up how we need to be encouraged how we need to be supported by the family by the community uh, i think that is one of the things from three of you the common things that we found that because com uh, communities neighbors families schools 
you know, the importance of having all those platforms, all those places, community support that woman needs in order for her to excel and uh, uh, live uh, to her potential. Now uh, we talk about the, you know, the importance of this kind of platforms, associations. Uh, most of the time, you know, women associations, because they are defined as women, people really have a really difficulties of um, uh, relating to it, or uh, you know, they don't want to be categorized within the uh, association that is defined by women. And, but I think, uh, you know, I, we believe that's why we've been committed to, as a Impala Communication as well, we've been committed to support these platforms. But I really wanted, because, you know, all of you are part of a really, especially in science, uh, you know, the platforms as well as EUV as uh, uh, professional platforms. These kind of platforms, what kind of uh, uh, benefits and uh, they have uh, for for us uh, as women, as and then as women leaders, uh, uh, briefly. If uh, if I start with uh, Dr. Raster, then all of you can follow with that. Okay, thank you, Meryl. Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll uh, give you uh, as an example our association, or I could also start with Dr. Azeb. Uh, as Dr. Azef said, I met her when she was uh, very young, maybe second year medical students. So they were having this Ethiopian Medical Students Association. So you see, through that association, not only the members of the association are benefiting, even we, the coastal leaders, were utilizing them for many of our activities. Uh, including the one which we were doing, you remember as if we were doing plantation, Tea plant, uh, planting trees in the compound that's to beautify Black Lion Hospital. Donating blood, they can network, share experience from each other. If I come to my association, for example, ours are mainly female academicians, researchers, and other innovators. So having such platform will help. You know, you can network each other, you can share experiences, you can really have this. The younger generation could see role models, you know, through the association, you can locate who is where. So you can have from seniors up to the juniors, where the two of them can network, can share information. And when you see seniors making it, you will say, why not me? So you could create such uh, uh, confidence in the young ones and also they could have a role model to look up to. Look up to. So even for the young girls, uh, associations like ours, uh, uh, we were arranging a forum where um, we were reaching out to young girls to share experiences like women in physics, women in math, mathematics, so that the younger ones could also say, even a female can do this, you see? So having such platforms will help you uh, for many things. You can help them in networking, as I said earlier. And also, instead of a single voice, when you are in such associations, you could have a strong voice even to advise policymakers and to voice for many things. For example, uh, one other example I could tell you in our session was, uh, ours was uh, established with a support with the uh, previous Minister of Science and Technology, most. So uh, most for many years, they were having these research grants. So repeatedly when they see it from year to year, they do have very few, if at all, female researchers winning grants. So we, advocated for a female dedicated research grant and they did it thank you to most so now in many universities we do have these female dedicated research grants so instead of being alone when you have such uh, associations societies you become strong and you can advocate for uh, uh, for things that could help uh, women succeed be it in research leadership or what have you so I think having such a session. But when having such a session, I always say I'm a woman of balance, not because I have two boys and a girl. So I always like balancing. So when we say women, we should be participatory. We should include the men. So I think uh, with this balancing, it's good to have such associations to advocate for women and also support each other. Thank you, Meron.
Um, same question uh, for uh, Dr. Sanait, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Miriam, for uh, elaborating on that. Um, well, we have, we have role models everywhere for me. My sisters and my mother are the biggest inspirations every day and uh, while I grew up. Uh, but again, we need to uh, act in a coordinated and collaborated manner. We need to form an organ organized associations like uh, MWA, for example. So MWA is uh, basically established to actually uh, further elaborate and um, support women physicians in attaining their career goals and also stand for their rights. And um, at the same time, it is uh, established to accentuate and highlight the impact of women and particularly women physicians on their community and on their surroundings. Uh, so with that, it is established. I'm so grateful that our um, our seniors tried to establish uh, the same association around some 20 years ago, but uh, it couldn't stay viable for them that they had to leave the country for various reasons. But again, our colleagues currently, three years ago, uh, again, get together and try to reestablish it. And this time they were successful and uh, later we, we joined them. So this is a MUA. And, uh, we always need mentorship. So one of the thematic areas that we work on is mentorship to create mentorship. Dr. Aster and uh, Dr. Aziv are, uh, I think, a working examples of how mentorships work. And uh, that is amazing. I'm so grateful to call a few female doctors uh, who I'm so grateful and proud to call my mentors. Uh, Her Excellency Dr. Leah Tadessa, Minister of Health. And uh, Professor Sanait, I really am grateful and appreciative of their efforts in leading all women efforts in international states. And I'm so grateful to call them our mentors. So as far as MY is concerned, we're now laying the foundation to have um, that association that we all dreamed of, an association which provides platform for women to exercise their full rights. Uh, and actually also, uh, uh, contribute to their society in a well-coordinated and efficient manner. Uh, in that regard, we've now launched, just on the verge of launching a new website. Uh, you can see on the chat box and you all, please log into our website and see what kinds of supports that we need and who we are and what we're doing right now. And um, I also want to take up to this opportunity to reach out to the international uh, audiences who may be there, please reach, out, please reach out to us because um, uh, we need your mentorship, we need your connections, and so that we will be able to deliver on the promises that we made to our members uh, in regards to advancing their professional careers on regarding uh, giving them a platform to contribute to their community, particularly women and those disadvantaged uh, communities and also to uh, in order to we uh, deliver on our promises for them to have a mentorship on such things so that's what I want to say on the importance of the association in particular thank you Mira uh, same question for Dr. Raze please um, I'm a big fan of uh, associations um, since I was in medical school, I was part of associations and, I, and I've seen um, how powerful they are when they are used appropriately. And I think for women especially, we need um, a proper platform where we can uh, learn from each other, um, get experiences and also um, as uh, in different platforms, professionally, personally, there are so many things that we can gain from each other. And I think, um, uh, one of the things that we need to learn is also supporting each other when we are um, succeeding in life. And um, and I think when you come to the healthcare uh, specifically, um, the healthcare system is made up of uh, a lot of uh, women, especially when you look at the health extension workers, most of them are women. Actually, the health extension uh, workforce was initially created um, uh, mainly by women. So 
uh, those we have a lot of resources that we can utilize and but when we um, try to um, look at uh, for example the number of specialists is very low when you look at the number of women um, and also if, if you look specifically to subspecialists that that number is going to be a little thinner and also and so we need um, people who uh, uh, who can model um, that uh, if women can uh, lead and also lead effectively and we need to see more people in leadership position as I have shared with you earlier uh, the biggest factor for me in moving forward is actually looking at women um, in leadership positions everywhere uh, so it has a, a big impact uh, when women are seen other women also, are also other girls and women are also going to be motivated to be uh, leading and to um, contribute their share and also uh, in conversations uh, we need to include the voice of uh, half of the population which is made up of women so most of the time when decisions are made if women are not in that in that room when the decisions are made uh, the, the needs of women the concerns of women are not, are not going to be put forward in that um, uh, in that uh, in those meetings and in those decisions so in order for the, the, the needs of the population to be considered and uh, especially women's health to be considered I think women should come to the forefront and I've seen that many people have taken that uh, taken up that role but sometimes there are there are multiple challenges that uh, make it uh, difficult to uh, penetrate in those uh, situations uh, because uh, in my experience, when uh, whenever um, I meet new people and I meet uh, and uh, I converse with people, the first thing that they would probably comment about is experience rather than the content of my speech. So that's the the minor the, the things that uh, uh, look minor to most of us, but a big challenge to overcome. And um, I think when we uh, become part of those conversations, we can um, uh, make better decisions and uh, um, consider, the, consider different scenarios. And it's also seen that in places where there are uh, many women leaders, the uh, effectiveness and the success of those uh, institutions is better in other countries. So maybe we, can, we should try it out. I think uh, I think you've made, uh, uh, Dr. Azim, you've made a really good good connections to the, to to the next point that we wanted to make because, as you said, the 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 actual uh, uh, makeup of all the health system mainly is uh, you know the majority of part is women, uh, especially from women extension uh, um, health extension workers, nurses. If you count all that within the health system, I think. Uh, you know, you can see, and and then as you go up, you know, those numbers becomes, as you said, as a specialist, and then uh, leadership positions, administration, so all this, when you get to that point, it doesn't actually reflect the workforce itself. So that, I think this leads to uh, really, uh, leads to the my next point, which is, uh, you know, just if you tell us, um, you know, the importance of having the main topic that we're talking about today uh, and relating to the, especially now the health crisis that we have in terms of COVID and, you know, what is the importance of having women leaders within the Ethiopian health system uh, uh, and then how that is reflected also into the, you know, the community having leaders on top, what does it mean uh, uh, into the community, the health, you know, the, the the community at large. Uh, so that question would go to Dr. Azeev again. Um, when you mentioned COVID, I was uh, watching the uh, constitutional inquiry earlier, and uh, I was so proud to see that there were three um, powerful women leading the conversation. And I think uh, uh, I'm not the only one who noticed that. I've seen some comments on social media right after that. So. That's the exact kind of effect we want to create in the health system. When you see more women leaders up front, uh, going to see how uh, well together they are, you know. And um, I've seen some researches where um, it's said that women don't take up leadership positions unless they are sure that they're going to 
make a difference to that position as compared to men. Men usually take more risks and they, um, they take the job even if they, they, they don't know uh, the exact um, uh, responsibilities that, that it comes up with. But when, when you're a woman, I think because we're faced with different challenges, we are more resilient and we look at things in different directions. Can I do it? Am I going to be effective? So we only take um, the positions when we really know that we're effective. And when you see those kind of leaders actually work their magic, and when it works, it's really um, uh, great to see. And it also is a testament that women can do anything and women can uh, influence the system positively. And I think that's a culture that we need to uh, cultivate. Um, but when we mention all this, it's obvious that we also uh, have some challenges because um, how, how is the, um, uh, the community made up? How many of us are really educated? How many of us have access to um, uh, the uh, literatures and uh, mentors? And I think that's the system that we, we also need to consider. And I think when you have more women leaders, uh, because they know the challenges that they have faced, they, they are more capable of making those uh, systems in place. And as Dr. Astor was doing, um, when people, when women are in a position of power, they often use it to also um, cultivate others' um, professional ambitions. And I think that's a great asset. Uh, and I think that's also something that uh, men in leadership position also have to learn. Uh, so uh, uh, this, well, similar questions, but uh, for Dr. Astier, if you also give us example of these leaders that uh, really made a great difference in, uh, in, in the health system, because most of the time, you know, we, we don't ac acknowledge and we don't celebrate and we, you know, we don't get those opportunities to actually highlight uh, the work of these leaders. And uh, uh, from your experience, if you can tell us, you know, the, the women who've made uh, uh, some we know, some we don't know, but who made a significant difference within the health system. Uh, thank you, Meron. Uh, like you said, I would also acknowledge that we don't know them all because it's, they're not documented, they're not searched, they're not recognized. If they were recognized, we would have known them all. Uh, maybe I would start. Many of you know Dr. Tawabet Bishaw. Dr. Tawabet Bishaw is prominent as well as well known by many but uh, for me I try to search after having uh, this panel I try to search with uh, other women uh, working in the ministry and maybe before I finish we should develop this culture of having the profile of this woman and documenting women in the health sector that make a change. At least they try the position even if they don't make it a change. So at least we should have this uh, uh, culture of profiling these women so that we know them, the next generation know them, everybody know them and also get encouraged by um, their achievements. Uh, maybe I, I should give you an example during when uh, HIV was like now COVID like how many years back it was HIV and there was a very strong woman at the ministry, maybe you have uh, already know, know her, Dr. Deborah Zaudi. You know, when HIV was even a problem in our neighbors like Kenya, they started a national AIDS control program in Ethiopia that was based at the Federal Minister of Health. And then after a change of regime, uh, all those nationals were decentralized and HIV got the opportunity to uh, prevail again. So uh, that was a strong woman I could give you uh, as an example who was decisive. And then after she left Ethiopia, she went to the World Bank. She was a big shot anyway. Many of you may already know her. Now she's in Harvard. And uh, that was uh, one of the examples I, I could give you. As I already said, Dr. Tawabet Pishaw, many of you uh, know her. But from those people whose name is not that much recognized, I have names like Dr. Fantai Makbub. Uh, the other one, Wezero Balladu. They said she has been the first, uh, like in Humara Health Center, she has been the first woman uh, to lead uh, that health center. Wezero Balladu al 
I also got an opportunity that, I mean, the other one was uh, Sister Bayez Agao. She has been the leader of training, licensing, qualifying. Maybe the younger generation you thought qualifying is now, but like how many years back in Ethiopia when I start my career, there was a qualifying exam given to medical doctors and the medical laboratory professionals that I was teaching. So, uh, I mean, at, at some point we were, uh, I could say in terms of quality, we were at a better position. So uh, I learned about this lady called Sister Bayez Aga who was leading uh, that uh, department. And the, later on, she was also a dean in Salam uh, nursing college. Uh, we don't have others like maybe the rest of them, maybe you know them. I also met another great lady, Sister Fukarta Belletta. She was a nurse, a public health specialist. Uh, in fact, when I, I, I always, my example always go to the success of HIV at the beginning of the epidemic, where we do have this great, great lady serving as counselors, like Sister Fukarta uh, Belletta, Wezaru Almas, and others. And later on, after how many years I met Sister Fikerta, she has been like leading a number of organizations, including HIV, reproductive health related, both in Ethiopia as well as uh, uh, regional associations related to HIV and uh, reproductive health. The last time I met her was uh, when we were serving as a board member of the Ethiopian Public Health Association, where she was our uh, vice president. So I would say those women are among, the, as I said earlier, we don't know them all, even if uh, we try to search about uh, their stories. But we do have like great ladies like Professor Shetaye, you know her from Gondar University, who have dedicated uh, her own life for, uh, uh, in, she's an endocrinologist, internal medicine specialist, Professor Shtai, Professor Oyoenarek, you know them uh, all, Professor Maaza. These are people uh, uh, that are big women in the uh, health field, I would say. Uh, and also currently we do have a number of women in the various universities we have as vice presidents of uh, universities like Dr. Mutikia at Sawa University. I also know a very young one from Dredo University, uh, Freyot. Uh, she's also in uh, a big position. And we have uh, uh, Dr. Takwam Debeba from at Sawa University. She's uh, also a dean. And maybe most of us may not uh, uh, learn about uh, Dr. Zufan Lago. I think she was the first dean maybe at the school of the first female dean, I would say, because uh, after her, I know I become the CEO, then Dr. Mahlet, now Dr. Takwam is uh, the dean of uh, school of medicine. So maybe we, we don't know much about Dr. Sufan Lago. She, she's an uh, ops gynae specialist, and she was also the dean of school of medicine. So these are among, you know, the, I would say the few men, but most of them, we don't know much about them. We have to profile them and we have to uh, document and to keep their stories. And also we have to recognize them. I have said Professor Maaza is also a public health uh, specialist. So I think um, if you know more other women, you can yeah. Exactly. So these are, these are I mean, uh, this is an example with the time that we have Eub. And MOA, or, uh, the science and all these uh, platforms are, are there to highlight also, you know, women's yeah. contribution within within the health system so that we see that, you know, uh, the benefit of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I see that phase back uh, and uh, I'm so glad you are back, Faye. <laughs> yeah, so, I will, uh, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to ask the next question and then uh, and then you can take over from that. So, Dr. Dr. Sanait, then you can follow up with with similar questions, but and then you also give us, you know, the importance of having. Uh, so, what is leadership within the health uh, within the you know the health system of Ethiopia, and, uh, and the importance of it uh, uh, from your perspective, please. Thank you, Merun. Thank you, uh, Dr. Astir, for laying out 
uh, all the great women that we know, we heard of, and that we want to celebrate every day. Like we are grateful they they taught us, uh, and they are actually part of who we are today. So I'm so grateful for you that you presented it that way. And um, I just want to highlight that we need to recognize each other and um, we need to start acknowledging the contributions of other women as well. Uh, women have been in the medical industry for, uh, since there has been a medical industry, but their, their great contributions has not been acknowledged as we hoped it would be. And that has limited further acknowledgements, uh, mostly because of lack of mentorship and support. Uh, with that, I want to I wanna say more about the unique position that women are, particularly women who are in medicine, and um, in particular related with leadership. I believe uh, leadership is not about holding positions. Leadership is not having you know, the hierarchy and the, the authority. Leadership it comes from within and uh, from understanding your environment. The, the, the structure, the, the community we live in and it's structured as, uh, structures leadership in a way that men should be the leaders. Uh, and uh, that is the masculine structure of the, the community and the structure that we are in. But as women, as uh, women particularly in medicine, uh, that gives us a new perspective to situations that happen uh, to conditions that already exist and we don't have the solutions yet. And for emerging situations like COVID, uh, you can see that the, the, the emergence of COVID has affected women and in so many different ways and women are the most impacted by this pandemic. So uh, as women in medicine and uh, taking our experience in navigating through med school, we need to know, how we, need, we need to actually work uh, in collaboration with our male colleagues and, uh, and understanding our, uh, 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 our environment and we need to contribute to our society uh, in that order. So with that, I say women need to be, uh, need to demand to actually contribute. Uh, we need to leverage our experiences and actually for the betterment of the community and actually contributing uh, for, for everything that happens around us. But for this, we need to understand the dynamic, the power, particularly the power dynamic around us. And we need actually to learn from our male colleagues and engage our male colleagues as well. Uh, because we're not, um, we basically need to learn how to uh, coexist uh, with our main colleagues. It doesn't mean that we are going to replace them all, uh, but we just need to take part in the table and to sit in the table. So that uh, takes actually, we need to carefully uh, um, investigate our surroundings. Uh, we need to seek for opportunities and uh, we need to grab opportunities whenever we have them. Uh, that being said, um, I think as women in medicine, as uh, frontliners, and uh, uh, as women who are most impacted by this pandemic, and by most new emerging conditions, and uh, by existing uh, situations like uh, poor maternal health care, um, uh, poor reproductive health care, and uh, being affected by different kinds of um, autoimmune diseases and um, you know malignancies and everything. I think we should put ourselves in the front line to fight all these conditions and leverage all our experiences in life, what we learn in life to bring that into a solution and uh, help the, our community. That's what I want to say about leadership. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Razib. Uh, and <laughs> apologies for the uh, technical That is glitch. a knife, by the way, not as a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Dr. Sennait, sorry, the names got uh, switched, sorry. So um, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, you uh, fra phrased it uh, perfectly, saying that uh, at any circumstance, we should uh, try to identify what are the opportunities women physicians can take up, right? Mm -hmm. So given our current circumstance with the pandemic all around uh, the world and here in Ethiopia, well, what do you think are the opportunities women physicians can take up in order to uh, get one step closer to leadership. I know you said leadership is um, not a title. Uh, everyone in their own form can be leaders, but what are the opportunities um, women physicians can take today um, to you know, uh, join the leadership uh, 
path. Thank you, Faye, for following that up. Uh, so basically, um, as, as women, we need to ask to see those at table. Uh, wherever we are, uh, whatever our positions are, wherever we are in the hierarchy, it doesn't matter. We need to ask to contribute. Uh, we need to ask to have actually our perspectives seen. We need to be ready to debate and actually we need to be ready for a resistance. We need, like, we need to fight for what we believe in. That, that's what I wanna say. And um, we, uh, all physicians, women, particularly women physicians, we could be anywhere. Uh, we could be frontliners as health facilities. We could be uh, just, a, just a clinician for a group of patients. We could be a custom leader. We could be a medical director, it doesn't matter. We can contribute wherever we are, but we need to demand to sit on the table. That's one thing. The other thing is we need to have that courage and uh, we need to, uh, uh, to take the responsibility to be the voice for those who are not allowed to actually raise their voices. We need to be voices for women who are underprivileged and for uh, children who are underprivileged. And we need to be uh, there for our patients. We need to be there. And this doesn't matter whether we hold a position or not. So that's one thing I can say. And uh, uh, women, wherever they are, they can bring a new perspective to anything. So uh, I wanna say this to our male colleagues. Hear your women colleagues and uh, hear them say what, what they wanna say because they usually think differently and they usually think they are so empathetic, so they probably, they most likely understand the situation their patients are in and, and their community are in. So uh, as women, we need to demand and uh, actually we need to actively seek for opportunities. That's what I'm gonna say. Thank you. Um, so one of our audience had left a comment and I would like to uh, state on that um, our audience, uh, pointed out Dr. Sion from uh, New York, I believe. She's very active on social media. Um, and, uh, you know, not being from the medical field, um, Dr. Sion is one of the most uh, prominent voices I've started following and hearing about what uh, women physicians do on a daily basis uh, in order for them to be heard, uh, which I commend her. And I hope more um, doctors would take that route to showcase uh, what they've done and also uh, pay tribute to what has been done in the past. Uh, so now, Dr. Aster, coming to you, I know you had stated um, there, there are, you know, a, a lot of women physicians that have come before us that have taken uh, leadership positions but have not been acknowledged. Do you think there is a culture, cultural barrier that is um, fostering uh, the women physicians not being uh, exposed to what they've what they're doing to the audience or to their patients, even to the general public, not being aware that there are so many women uh, leaders uh, that are physicians that are taking important roles but are not being visible. For instance, um, uh, it took this panel discussion for me to realize that there was a, a former CEO at the Quran Bissa Hospital. Uh, that is something that should have been celebrated and recognized as a country uh, to be able um, to have that platform and do you think so my question is uh, is there a cultural barrier that we're not addressing as a society that promotes uh, women taking leadership position and getting acknowledged and sharing that uh, experience uh, thank you Faye uh, in the first place and not only for women our culture of uh, acknowledging and recognizing each other is not as such strong I would say not only for the women or even for you know historically we do have great great leaders of this country including the women but we do have this culture of not recognizing not acknowledging not celebrating the success of each other so uh, i would say regardless of gender when it comes to women uh, the barrier starts from family community you know in the first place uh, there, uh, our culture itself doesn't encourage for the woman to be, you know, when you are shy, you know, 
you are you are you are you are taken as a nice woman when you are shy when you are someone who are speaking out you are not i mean encouraged uh, to do that including in our culture so for a woman there is this societal cultural and also uh, everyone around you you know for female to be successful uh, i uh, it was a uh, uh, Dr. Aze was saying, you know, women only take positions when they are sure, because you know what, everybody around her is waiting for her to fail and then to say, aha, this is what we said. So for that reason, women, uh, they are expected to do like double, triple, maybe four times that men, uh, that, that men do, you know, when men make mistakes. You know, it's taken like something easy. But if a female does something, that will be exaggerated. So the women themselves are not coming up because they don't want to fail. They don't want to make mistake. I think making mistake is should be normal. For me, I've never af been afraid of making mistakes. Never afraid of being failed because my life was full of failure, including in the university, maybe I didn't tell you when I started up. I was dismissed when I was a first year student. Then I joined at Saba University again, and I graduated among the top 10 students. So, you know, if you don't be afraid of failure, just take it and try it and try your best as much as as much as you can and also as uh, all of you have said it you can you know uh, mobilize whoever is around you supporting you we women we know how to ask to get support we are good communicators so i think uh, it's, it's it's the culture is you know it's it's global i would say for ethiopians we are kind of shy we don't come forward and also the society is not encouraging you to come forward and uh, make mistake learn from your mistake I think that's why most women are not coming uh, to the front line. And regarding recognition and acknowledgement, as I said, our culture is not good, regardless of gender. How many of us have uh, been acknowledging our forefathers who have been dying for us to be proud Ethiopians? So I think uh, our culture of recognizing each other is not as such encouraging. I think this is an area that all of us should improve. And uh, I mean, uh, otherwise we would have known, no, the, the, the few women that I mentioned is just the tip of the iceberg. There are very many women, as, as you say, they don't have to have uh, the top position, but there are very many women. Uh, for, if I tell you in the Black Lion Hospital, all those head nurses, all those, you know, there are very women who are, uh, um, uh, spearheading in uh, 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 in their area of work in the different departments in the different units so uh, as i said earlier we are not recognizing each other we are not profiling their stories and we are not uh, uh, that's why uh, we all uh, do not know them all thank you okay thank, thank you, you. Uh, uh, I would like to point out at this uh, time, obviously, <laughs> uh, that's one of the norms that AWOB is trying to break, is to be able to acknowledge people while they're still alive, while they're with us, so that they know they're appreciated uh, for what they're doing uh, for us in our community. So um, I think it's up to uh, all of us, uh, our associations, our society, uh, Inawa and uh, Sawest, to be uh, taking up uh, this challenge of being able to recognize individuals while they're still here with us. Um, that said, one thing I would like to say about failure is there's the saying that I like, failure is the key to success. Each mistake teaches us something. Uh, that was by um, Mohari Ushiba. Uh, it's a quote. And I really look up to that because you're right. Every failure is a learning uh, step. A learning process, yeah. Correct. Correct. So thank you for that. So my next question would be for uh, Dr. Azim. Um, I know uh, one of the things that really surprised me uh, about you is one, you're very young, uh, and you know, at an, an, and in a leadership uh, position, which is very impressive. Uh, not only that, but your experience being the only psychiatrist at uh, Deborah Mark Osrepara Hospital that serves five million people. That is quite a uh, a task to take. So if you could share a little bit uh, of your experience being uh, the only psychiatrist and the fact that you were uh, you had to 
coach and educate some of your uh, counterparts and colleagues to um, be uh, the solution to the problem of having shortage in psychiatrists, correct? So if you can tell us, share a little bit about that and uh, how you overcame some of the challenges you faced and who was there to support you. Um, thank you so much uh, for mentioning that, actually. It was one of the biggest challenges that I have uh, taken. Um, and, I, and I think, um, uh, as you mentioned earlier, I think every failure and every uh, challenge is, is an opportunity, and that's how I see things as well. And, uh, and earlier I mentioned that men usually take risks, and um, that is one of the reasons that... Um, that they uh, are able to take up leadership positions. And sometimes I force myself to take risks. And that was one of the things that, that was one of the risks that I took. Um, I was not forced to go. I was not uh, obligated to go. I had other opportunities that came up to me, but I found that uh, working in a challenging environment is going to make me a better individual and a better leader. And um, working, um, in the community, with the community, is I think much more impactful uh, rather than just holding a position uh, in some institution. That's my opinion. And so um, the, there, there were two roles that uh, were especially challenging for me. One is, as I said earlier, I was the only woman specialist uh, in the area um, and, and in the university actually. Um, and uh, the second one was uh, I was the only psychiatrist and there was no psychiatrist uh, staff at that university prior to that. And so uh, I had the role of defining what a woman specialist is and also what uh, a psychiatrist is as a professional. And that was a big task because the first comment that I received when I went there was one of my colleagues said, I thought all psychiatrists were crazy. You don't, you don't seem crazy. <laughs> so that was one of the, the myths that I had to bust and I always had to check my own behavior so that I don't appear somewhat uh, out of place and uh, out of, you know, I was checking myself a lot of times and that's not um, an easy thing to do. Uh, people think um, a certain way about you and then you have to fulfill that expectation. And um, also as a woman, uh, one of the comments that was shocking to me at first was uh, one of my colleagues said to me, um, uh, he wanted me to be part of this uh, committee in the, in the school. And when I asked him why he wanted me to be in that committee, he said, because you want something to look at. And that was shocking to me because um, I always valued um, that I would be um, held in, in my profession I'll, I'll be seen uh, through my profession and through the content of uh, what I'm doing or uh, what I'm speaking about rather than my appearance. And I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be part of a committee just so that other men who are my colleagues have something to look at, which, which is uh, a, a very stereotypical thing to say. Um, and I think um, because the reason that I took that risk was because I wanted to set up a mental health um, uh, uh, a mental health uh, system in that area where, where it didn't have anything before. Um, I had to start from scratch, uh, but luckily there were some other professional psychiatry professionals who are not psychiatrists but have been doing some work and it was uh, really an opportunity to, uh, for me to build on that and they were really supportive, they were really um, uh, they were they they were listening to me and I, I didn't have that much difficulty in making my points and uh, in being heard. There was a good administration that helped me uh, achieve some of the things that I set out to do, and I was able to um, form a psychiatric ward with uh, uh, eleven beds, and our, we increased our outpatient capacity uh, by um, uh, three times than before, and we also had some programs in. Uh, on the radio to reach the public and um, but throughout all that uh, as I said earlier the, the, the biggest um, problem despite those achievements was that I always felt lonely and um, and mainly uh, because uh, my husband was in Addis and I had to uh, travel every month to see him and he had to uh, he was the only uh, one supporting me in this endeavor 
because it's uh, not really accepted in our community to be uh, for the women to be the one going outside um, the comfort zone and doing some things and he was really supportive but I always felt like I was the only one I was alone and um, but luckily I was able to survive it for three years thank you yes that is uh, quite an accomplishment and I think you should be sharing this story as frequently as possible so people get inspired and know that it's not impossible to do tasks that are that has never been done before we shouldn't wait for someone to do it it should be us if, if not us uh who if not now when you know that saying so um i think that should be the takeaway from this experience so thank you for that dr azeb uh so my next question would be um uh, for dr sanait um as a leader uh and you know founder of associations uh, to support women uh, in the medical field. Um, what are the steps been taken to encourage women to join uh, the leadership path uh, in terms of you know, government and associations, but at the, also at the same time, uh, at the college level, uh, what kind of uh, encouragement or process is there to encourage more women to take on the medical path? Thank you, Faye, for... Um and thank you, Azeb, for your very amazing work in elaborating on that. Uh, so uh, as, as the association, we're, um, one of our thematic areas is actually to uh, promote women actually advance uh, their careers. At the same time, they should be able to attain some leadership competences as well. So uh, through the association, what we're actually trying to establish is uh, to ha to act as a platform for women to obtain those competencies. We are going to have series of trainings, actually skill-based, competence-based trainings will be provided. And we are trying to network with international platforms and international providers uh, so that our members uh, get access to that. Uh, we are trying to also establish a system where all women in medicine understand their strengths uh, and uh, work on their on their strengths and uh, strong sides than their weaknesses and um, capitalize on that, cultivate their uh, natural abilities, and um, uh, so that they will be able to deliver for themselves and for the community they they serve as well. So those are right now, as you as um, I've said before, we're just laying the foundation for the association to stand on its two feet. And uh, we're trying to uh, actually establish an international networking platforms so that our members would leverage those platforms to advance their careers and also their leadership uh, competences. Uh, I want to stress back on the fact that we need to demand to sit on the table, uh, regardless whether we've been trained on um, leadership skills or anything, we're born leaders. We women are, wherever we see, them, we see them, educated or not educated, go to the very remote rural areas. You see young girls actually taking care of, care of other group of young children because they have an inborn innate instinct of that leadership. But we need to actually work on that to actually uh, uh, be efficient in utilizing our natural, natural abilities and we need to seek for opportunities to develop them and enrich all those uh, you know, abilities. Uh, when I say uh, to demand to sit on the table, it is actually our right. It's not like being handed, uh, it's being handed over to like, it, we're not just giving that. It's our right to sit on the table and to contribute to our society. So that's, uh, that's that one thing what we should do. We also need to actually tap into uh, the um, initiatives that the government has put in place. Like uh, right now, it's amazing to see that 50% of the cabinet as women. Uh, I, for myself, I can see that uh, I'm very happy to see that the Minister of Health is actually a woman. And, uh, um, you can see that when you demand, you get it. For example, um, Ethiopian Medical Women Association was not uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the advisory council 
for uh, the COVID-19 task force in the ministry, we requested and immediately we were granted. So now, right now, as we speak, four of our members from the executive team are part of the advisory council for COVID-19 in the Ministry of Health. So we shouldn't just like, it's not that um, we ask for it and it's not that they're, they're giving us because they're nice, but it is our right to sit on the table and it is actually um, our mandate and responsibility to also contribute for, for the society. Uh, it, uh, we're in a very good era right now, I say, because uh, we can participate in anything we ask to participate for. Uh, we can raise questions to the PM directly. This is amazing now because we have 50% of his cabinet are women. We're represented there, but we, again, it's very important to actually empower women who are also in the position and we are not, who are not in the position. For that, we need to empower each other. Women who are actually holding positions should empower other women who are not holding positions because we know that everyone can be a leader and when they lead, they deliver. So uh, I, I think that's one thing I want really stress on. Uh, there are in in in, um, in the higher education and um, uh, and also in general in education, there are so many platforms that are that women can tap into. We have the affirmative actions to promote women. We need to use those opportunities to our advantage in a way that can be helpful for us and that can be that can help us that can give us the platform to actually contribute to our society yeah thank you uh, thank you so uh, to add on to that uh, is there any kind of uh, policy work that's in place to support women that are already in the leadership position in terms of maternity leave safe work environment uh, that is to foster uh, for them to stay in because one of the critical things that we see when women join in any kind of leadership platform is uh, once they start uh, decide to start a family what happens is they um, the policies that are in place are not supportive enough for them to come back to work so is there any kind of work that's being done uh, in terms of policy to support women yeah, I can. I am. Yeah, I. I am going to refer back to the cabineting because mm -hmm. that is the very the most important thing that we need to tap into. Uh, the other thing in terms of policy is now it is made four months for maternity leave. Uh, that is also an amazing step. A few years back, it was only six weeks, and um, and few years uh, even uh, a year back, it was only uh, three months, and now it is. Four months, I see that as a huge uh, progress. Uh, the other things that are being done, um, for example, in our ministry, are we're developing a gender-based violence manual and we strategy to respond to, um, uh, in a coordinated manner. Uh, we have we have had a gender mainstreaming documents and a gender mainstreaming manual, uh, so that every policy in the government that is made being made it could be viewed by the gender lens those are uh, very few but amazing steps uh, that gives us the platform uh, uh, also um uh, people Thank you. and leadership are uh, uh, a matter of uh, for managing our time because we only have a few more minutes to uh, address some of our audience questions i'm going to cut you short uh, i'm going to ask dr azib um the following question um what are your thoughts on uh, women that want to join, that are interested in global health? Um, what kind of uh, advice would you give in terms of um, uh, addressing global health and joining the leadership path? Okay, thank you. Um, I, don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm the right person to ask about global health, but I think, um, because I'm not the expert in global health, um, but I think, um, in any career, I think the, the, the main thing to do is um, to find mentors, I think is the, the, the biggest thing. And women mentors are, I think, um, the best kind of mentors if uh, you're a woman, um, because the, the challenges that you might face are might be similar. It's good to look for mentors. It's good to look, uh, to find the, all the information that uh, is possible in that area and to see if that's the right fit for you. If, uh, if you can, um, if there are any challenges that you anticipate and 
maybe uh, you need to explore those and discuss with your mentors. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so while I still have, oh, I'm here on, okay. Uh, so what is the feedback that you get from your employees, their reactions, and uh, what's, is there a support system that's in place for you with your current position right now? Sorry, uh, is that for me? Yes, yes. Uh, what was the question? Sorry. Oh, the question is, uh, what kind of support system do you have with your employees? Um, and also, um, you said you are also working with uh, Addis Ababa University. So, um, what kind of uh, challenges do you notice with students, and um, how do you address them? Okay, um, I don't have employees. I, w I work. Uh, I am an employee myself, um, mm -hmm. but I think. Um, the, the, the biggest quality is um, to have as a leader, one of the, the, the leadership roles is leading teams. And I think physicians have uh, one of the biggest roles leading teams because um, physicians are considered that they're the team leader whenever they're working because they, they can work with nurses, they can work with laboratory patients and other people. And um, they're often forced to, uh, to take on that leadership position. And I think we need to embrace that, and we need to also have uh, that multidisciplinary look uh, view, um, so that we can understand the strengths of everyone, the, the in any areas of improvement that people can um, have, and make discussions, have discussions with the team. And I think that's uh, the way I uh, worked when I was after Bram Marcos. Uh, at the hospital that I worked in, I worked with. Um, mental health professionals and psychiatry nurses, clinical nurses, and uh, we had regular discussions uh, what their concerns were, what they observed daily in their day-to-day uh, -day activities, and if anything that I can help them with. Um, so we had that respectful um, uh, relationship where everyone can contribute, and I also made it a point to notice what excites this person in this um, uh, when, when, while they're working here. Even though um, um, most uh, health workers are in the uh, public sector, uh, we, we can't treat it just like any other job. We can't just uh, come in in the morning uh, and then leave at the end of the day. We need to have some kind of purpose. And we, because of the different challenges within the health system, because it's not as developed as uh, we would like, um, sometimes we, we face some burnout. We, uh, get used to the challenges and we, we resign, um, you know, not, we, we don't, we're not actively involved. And I think if you're, if you want to be a leader, one of the things that you should look out for is, uh, what am I missing in this person, in my colleague? Uh, what, what is the reason that they joined this uh, profession? What excites them? What is the thing that they're most um, passionate about? And, and uh, in conversations, I try to look for those and when I find them, I try to build on them. So I give them some readings. I, I connect them to that person who, uh, who has an expertise in that area. And that way, uh, our, our conversations are not just about the daily events. It's also about what they found out through those connections and what they, they found out through those um, uh, documents or you know, researches. And I think um, finding the strengths in each person is, I think, a great uh, leadership uh, quality to have. Great, thank you, Dr. Azeb. Uh, Dr. Raster, um, one of our audience member, audience member is uh, very curious to know, what was the reason uh, you were expelled from first year of school? Because normally a lot of people just, because they've been expelled, they stay there, uh, but you had the courage and drive to come back and be where you are today. So can you share um, that please? So, oh, can you unmute? Unmute. Oh, unmute your mic. No, somebody has to do it. We can hear you now. We can hear you. Can you can hear me. Okay, my story is a long one. You know, throughout my life. So, my first year. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Uh, okay, so my first year in university, it started with a tragedy. My elder brother had a terrible car accident. He became quadriplegic. So, you know, for me, a fresh student coming from the eastern part of Ethiopia to Addis, everything was a new environment, plus this tragedy, you know, the whole family had a terrible time during that first year. So I couldn't focus on my study. So I failed, but the good thing, I met a very nice person. She's Dr. Tatana Samara. She said, it's not failing. You learn from your failure. And uh, the main thing is to go back and succeed. So anyway, I did it. He was quadriplegic for four years. So when I became a four-year student, again, my brother and the second one, they both died within 24 hours. So my life, uh, my first year life is the most terrible one that I had throughout my life. So what I always advise to my students, to anyone, never ever give up. So I always say, try it A to Z. So for me, I, I have plan A, B to up to Z, I don't care. So never ever give up whatever happens to you learn from it and then when you <laughs> yeah I, I always become emotional when i speak about it so better i leave it here and when we talk of women i always say it's good to have 50 percent in the parliament but remember sdg five and four about gender equity education for all we still have like 75 percent of the illiterate like two thirds of the illiterate are women like i mean in the leadership position we have very a quarter of women are in the leadership position so there is a long way ahead of us to bring those and enable make them capable in the leadership position i don't like this quota thing you know if we are, if we don't make female females capable to be leaders having mentors sharing experiences giving trainings you know having such forum mm -hmm. uh, we will we will even make them a victim of lack of self confidence so i think when we talk of uh, women we have to consider all of this. And for my fellow young Ethiopians and elsewhere in the whole globe, if you fail, you can still succeed. Thank that's you for what, that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's Thank what you. I'm, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, and I, I also saw one on the chat with family and others. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So the next question is um, for, uh, well, I guess, you can start with answering how do you balance the work life balance being a you know a professor a physician a mom uh, how do you balance those okay thank you again uh, my family life started when i was a phd student where i have to live like uh, a three-year-old and a less than like one one-year-old child at home and i have to go to amsterdam to do my phd that was also again a challenge as a mom and as a researcher but again with the support of uh, my family supporting my husband i was able to succeed and do my phd as a sandwich sandwich program between ethiopia and amsterdam when it comes to work especially with uh, the touch CO position. I was also an academician at Addis Ababa University Department of Medical Laboratory Sciences because that CO position is a kind of a rot rotation position. So I was having like both teaching as well as being the CEO of the Black Line Hospital. So I'm, I always I have to take back work to home uh, my third daughter was a young one. The two boys suffered during my PhD, but with my daughter, she also suffered when I became a CEO of the Black Line Hospital. But as much as possible, I was taking care wherever I go, to a morning house, to a neighbor, to, to visit a sick people. She, she was always with me like my bag. So as much as possible, I was trying to compensate whatever time is left. I was trying to share with my kids, otherwise, uh, we have to balance, we have to, you know, manage our times. We don't have the 24 hours, plan it, and then have time for your kids, time for family, time for teaching time. Uh, yeah, that's, that was so as much as possible. Prioritizing what's important to you. Because prioritizing, you of course, yes, of course, yes. You have to prioritize and manage your time. Great. 
and also yeah. delegates. Uh, uh, luckily, at the Black Lion Hospital, I was someone delegating to others. So every department was uh, doing their job, including students like Azim was helping me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so being able everyone. to resource wisely around you, your support system, your family, your friends, even your colleagues. So My colleagues, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from Yapsara Petros. Uh, this is for uh, Dr. Sanait. Um, she's asking, what is the best way to, nav to navigate career transition if public and uh, or global health when women have higher career aspirations? Thank you, Dr. Asir, and uh, thank you, Faye, uh, and Yapsara for forwarding that question. Uh, well, I think, um, be the best you could be wherever you are, uh, so that you step on that and um, uh, uh, you know move forward to the next one. Uh, so wherever you are, do everything you could to be the best at your job at whatever you do, and um, that would be your uh, you know first uh, step to take so that you navigate to the ne to the next one. That's what I want to say to her. So it would be to leverage uh, your network, right? And if yeah. you are sensible and an expert in your field, you're able to transition easily because uh, you have qualifications, not just a show of numbers, basically. Okay. Exactly. Maybe and um, you really maybe Faye. Learn. Yes. Maybe Faye. Mm -hmm. uh, if yes. I would add, mm -hmm. you know, nobody knows everything. You can learn every time. Be a long life learner. If I tell you my experience, I wanted to be a medical doctor assigned to be a vet, I finished in biology. And I, I was assigned back to a health laboratory, which I have never heard of. So I was curious to learn from my, uh, you know, academically, I was a BC holder, but I was learning from, from those junior and senior medical laboratory technicians how to count cells. So be open to learn. Be open to accept criticisms. Be open, you know, to be a lifelong learner. So I think you can, you can, you can be successful by being open and by being a lifelong learner. As I would say, learn from anyone around you, even from those who are younger than you. I always learn from my students. So <laughs> that's my advice to everyone. You can learn from anyone around you. That is Thank a very you. good point. Thank you for sharing that. So. Uh, we are towards the end of our program, but before we do, there are still some questions I would like to address, right? Um, five minutes, okay. Um, my question is uh, for Dr. Sanait. Uh, back to you again. Uh, what are the, some of the key challenges, if you had to point out one and two challenges that you've faced being in a, a high leadership position, like being an advisor to the minister, uh, what are the two challenges they are currently facing and what are you doing to overcome them? Wow, that's a tough one, Faye. Um, uh, to be honest, um, where I am now uh, as an advisor to the minister is uh, where I am most supported. So um, I really want to thank my male colleagues uh, uh, usually, I am the only women in the room, uh, but uh, I'm well heard. They hear me, not because I'm loud. I'm very loud, but uh, not because only that I'm loud, but they really listen to me and appreciate my contribution. So uh, I really want to see more men like my colleagues who, who really are supportive of their female colleagues and who really are there for female colleagues. Uh, and I wish everybody had that, but uh, it was not like this, uh, the way I come up to this. So I had to struggle to be listened. I had to uh, deliver, I had to fight, active fights, uh, to, to actually deliver on something that would benefit everyone. But uh, usually I am the only one with an old perspective or a new, um, you know, when you're the only one in the room, you're usually the one, the old one. So I had to fight all these fights. I had to fight for acceptance. Um, I had to show off my work uh, so that I be accepted. Uh, those were my challenges. But you know, uh, 
that's why I see whenever you see opportunities, uh, whenever you get into a new room that you're not comfortable in, seek for support. First, identify who can be your best support and stick with that and uh, leverage on that, build on that, so that others see who you really are and start supporting you. So uh, that's, that's what they can say. Uh, also at home, mm -hmm. yeah, I wanna say this, also mm -hmm. at home, um, I am the most lucky one probably um, than everyone else because um, I am very supported by my husband and mm -hmm. my family. Uh, I can say that they all live for me. They, 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 I am their priority. That actually supported me to be to act like how I act now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, that's a very good takeaway. Uh, one thing I would like to do uh, for to our audience, uh, there are some questions that we didn't answer, but we will try to answer them over text. Uh, but in the meantime, for us to wrap up, I would like to take this time uh, to give Dr. Aster uh, to tell us uh, how people can uh, know more and participate in SEWEST. Uh, same thing for Enewa, uh, where people can go, if you guys can tell us where people can go to know more about your association and how can they, how they can join you and also um, be able to be part of the solution for, to join women as leadership. Okay, you have one minute each. I'll start with Dr. Raster. Okay, thank you so much. For those of you who are interested, Society of Ethiopia Women in Science and Technology, it has members from medicine, agriculture, engineering, mathematics, and associate members from the humanities field. Uh, I, 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 was, I was chatting to Dr. Zaga, I've, I've seen her here. If she could post the website address, uh, otherwise, maybe you can Google us, Society of Ethiopia Women in Science and Technology. I will share you, Faye, so that you could post it. Now, I don't want to go out of we'll, this We will have screen. it on our uh, social media platforms for anyone who's interested. I will do that. I will do that. And it's a membership for all uh, science fields, including health. And uh, Dr. Thank you. for Enewa. Thank you, Dr. Aster. We have emiwa.org.h uh, as a website. Please log on to it. It's uh, posted on the text um, on the chat box right now. Uh, ask questions. We have uh, um, a Twitter, um, emiwa uh, underscore Ethiopia. Uh, we have a Facebook account, Ethiopian Medical Women Association. Uh, please follow us on those and um, please contribute. We want you all to be in that. Well, I, I want to personally thank all three of you for being here with us. You guys are an inspiration for all of us, not just people from the medical field, but seeing women in leadership positions, being able to make critical decisions that impact us um, is truly inspiring. Uh, please continue to do what you're doing and uh, collaborate, of course. That's why we're here. It will create this platform so that associations like yours can, um, uh, you know, uh, come together so that we can impact uh, our community bigger and wider together. So thank you all for being here and for our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll have more information available on our website um, uh, for any questions that you have, uh, also on our social media at uh, AWOB Ethiopia, we'll be there uh, after this uh, to answer any questions you have. And most importantly, we wanna thank Impala Communications uh, for hosting us today, thank you so much. Uh, all the way across the pond in London, so thank you. Uh, we will have um, a membership drive uh, starting next month for AWIP, so if you are interested to know, make sure you join us next week on um, May 27th. We'll have a, a webinar uh, addressing all of the questions you have, you want to uh, know more about AWIP, what we're doing, and the causes we're supporting. Okay, so thank you all for joining us again and wishing you all a safe and wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you for having us. Bye.